Hello and welcome to Your Coaching Journey, a podcast for doctors about coaching. Whether you are a coaching doctor, a doctor who is learning to coach, or a doctor who'd like to build coaching into your professional life, then this is the podcast for you. Hi, I'm Helen Leathers and with me today is my co-host and business partner, Tom Dillon. Good morning, Tom. Good morning. How are you today? I'm absolutely marvellous. Good. How are you? I am all so marvellous. Marvellous. Yes. I've just made some sourdough bread. Oh. I told you I'd get it in somewhere, you didn't did, I? Yeah. Yes. I'm very excited for my sourdough bread. Sourdough. You didn't wait long to get it in, did you? That's straight <laughs> off the bat, isn't it? <laughs> sourdough bread. So how is your sourdough bread? Delicious. Actually, actually. I have had a piece. It is delicious, I must say. Yeah. You've done very well. It's but it at this point in time it seems very labour intensive to to bake a boat. A loaf of bread. Because you're it's t- taken you a whole week. Yes, oh. because you've taken it from the point of starting the starter. Starting but actually, the starter. if you think that last night I made the bread and today I baked it, it didn't take long at all. Okay. We have some questions. <laughs> Shall we move on with the actual podcast? Yes, today also? we will be answering <laughs> listeners' questions. Yes, What's our first are. question, Helen? Our first question is from Beth, who is a GP partner. Okay. And asks, I've been asked to mediate between two practice partners who don't see eye to eye. I feel that a coaching approach would be really useful. What approach should I take? Uh, get some mediation training. <laughs> yeah. Mediation is difficult. Yeah, it's not coaching. No. I, I am a trained mediator as well as a trained coach. And I can see the similarities between the two. And it is quite interesting, actually, because I, I, I'd spent some years coaching before I did my mediation training. And obviously, when you're coaching, you just hear one person's side of the story. And, you know, whilst you're trying to be objective, you are kind of on their side. They're your client. You're kind of supporting them in navigating their way through it. But you only hear their story. Yeah. And you've no idea what the other side of it looks like. And the first time I got involved in some mediation, so I was being paid to mediate, I went in, as I would seeing a coaching client, I sat down and had a conversation with someone and they told me how awful the situation was and how awful this other person was being. I thought, oh God, it does sound awful. Oh, I see what's going on here. And then I had a conversation with the other person who told me their story. I thought, oh God, he's completely different. <laughs> and I don't know why I would have expected anything else because it's mediation and you are trying to bring two opposing sides of a conflict together or disagreement together. Uh, and that was just about ways of working for team members. But it demonstrated to me that there is a difference between coaching and mediation and mm-hmm. that you are holding a space in the middle. Um, so, so some of the skills will be the same, which is still trying to facilitate that conversation. But it's a conversation between two other people and you're sat in the middle of it. So it's very different. Now, as a GP partner, you might not have the resources to engage an external mediator it might fall upon you to mediate between these people. And that might be, I mean, I would check with HR to mm-hmm. make sure that's okay. I, I think there's a conflict of interest if you're a GP partner and you're trying to do that work. Um, so check with your HR department. But if they are happy for you to sit and have quite a an informal mediated conversation, um, you could take a coaching approach. But I, I think the safest way to approach this is either to get an external mediator in, my rates are very reasonable, and, <laughs> or, or to actually go and get some training. It's not going to help with this particular mm. um, example, but, but it's difficult for a small practice because you're not necessarily going to have one of your members of staff who can mediate between different parties within the practice because how can they be impartial? Um, you as a partner within the practice have an interest in the outcome. Mm. So approach with some trepidation, maybe. I think so, And yeah. some questions. Yeah. I know I've been asked to do some mediation in the past and I'm not trained in mediation, mm. so I turned it down because I, I just... Where would I start? I have no yeah. idea. Um, it's a very... It's a similar skill. We're still facilitating a conversation but there is work to do to learn how to do it well. Yeah. Um, and I went through a phase where the mediation, <laughs> I had quite a few mediation uh, invitations for me to go and mediate that got ca- cancelled at the last minute. And I think that's quite a common thing where 
someone says, right, I want mediation. And then when it's actually arranged, they realise they're on perhaps a dodgy footing and step back from the mediation. Mm. Had one person actually leave the organisation rather than have mediation. Wow. So it's quite a fraught mm. activity. It's not, it's not as simple and straightforward as coaching. No. Um, so it could end up much messier than you think it will be, which is why it's good to get a trained professional in to do it. And that communication with HR, really important. Yes, well. yeah. Just I say, you, it might be seen by one or other of the parties involved. You might seem, be seen to be biased in some way or not impartial. So um, we want to avoid that outcome. That someone could, after the mediation, go, well, don't you turn down like that because you're on their side. Or, you know, mm -hmm. We don't want to. So, yeah, I would recommend getting someone else involved. Excellent. Thank you. Hopefully that has helped Beth out. I have another question for you. Ooh. From uh, Caroline, who is a GP, asking how you would differentiate group coaching and team coaching. Group coaching is group coaching and team coaching is team coaching. Thank you. That's very clear. Would you like to elaborate <laughs> on that? <laughs> yeah, so uh, from my perspective, group coaching is bringing a group of people together, perhaps around a common theme. So let's say you had you you had an offering of some group coaching, a group coaching program for women around their confidence. Yeah. So there's an audience you're attracting them to come to a session where you know what's going to be talked about. It's about how you increase your confidence for a group of women. And you might engage in activities that they can all do independently and they'll work on for themselves. So let's say the Wheel of Life is an activity that you will offer them to do or you might get them to think about their values. So they all do their independent. It doesn't really matter what they come up with because it's theirs and they carry on individually, but they're within a group context. And there will be group conversations going on and you might do group coaching activities where people talk about what's going on for themselves. But it's not about the coming together and the sharing of ideas and values. So you could you could have a whole group of women talking about confidence that had completely different values and it wouldn't matter within a group setting. Team coaching tends to be around people that work as a team. So you might be invited in to work with a team about how they work better together. So that could be a combination of group coach <laughs> the team coming together and you coaching all of them together as well as coaching independently separately so you might have one-to-one -one sessions with each member of the team but then come together to work on maybe common goals common common values common purpose and um, so it's how do we work better as a team so there's a common aim rather than individuals moving in in a similar direction. Hopefully you're helping them to work more cohesively. So very, just very different offerings, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And That's you've great. probably done more group coaching than I have. I yeah. don't really tend to run group programs. I mean, I've done group supervision um, where, again, people are working in their own coaching businesses, but coming together for that group supervision. But it's, so it's that similar to group coaching. Yeah. Um, and I've probably done more team coaching than you have. So yes. actually going into an organisation, working with a particular team and helping them to think about how they communicate more effectively, how they move together um, towards a common purpose. Well, that sounds like a very clear differentiation between the two. Mm. So uh, hopefully, Caroline, that's helped out a little bit. Lovely. I've got a question for you now. Have you? And it's about reflection. So Jonathan, who is a consultant, has written in to say, I'd like to reflect on my coaching. Is there a template for doing this? Oh, I don't think I've ever seen a template as such, but I think there's um, a system of reflection, if you like. Um, so I'll, I'll share what I know about that. Um, I think reflection is is not the same as rumination. Let's let's start there. So looking back and going, oh, I didn't do that well. That's not reflection. <laughs> reflection is looking back 
and saying, what did I do? What worked and what didn't? And what can I learn from this and do differently in the future? So there's four elements really. Um, and I think if you, let's say post coaching session, has spend some time answering those four elements, then you will get some really great information about yourself as a coach. You'll be able to pat yourself on the back for the things that you've done well. You'll be able to explore the things that didn't go quite so well and be able to look at um, what that gives you going forward or what you might do differently going forward. So one of the other things that I have seen is three questions. What, so what, now what? And that kind of overlays what you said. Oh, that sounds like something to to work on an example around. So this is something that's happened within the coaching. So what happened in the coaching? Okay. So uh, let's say I used the wheel of life. Okay. So what the what is using the wheel of life? So what happened when using the wheel of life? Uh, It was very effective in helping the coachee to understand where they are now and where they want to be in the future. Brilliant. So now what does that mean to you as a coach? Uh, as So for me, it kind of reinforces that efficacy of using the wheel of life. For the coachee, I think it will allow them to return to that those particular elements that are on the wheel and say, okay, that's where I was now and that's where. So for that coaching engagement, we'll be able to touch base further down the line and go, oh, you, you were here last time we met. Where are you now? Um, so, yeah. Good. Oh, that works then. Yes. Well done. So it is a template really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's right. Yeah. I want Pretty something that occurred to me in reading out the question was that uh, we on our programme have coaching feedback forms. So for the observer to complete and for us to complete when we're doing an assessment and it looks at different coaching skills that people might use in their coaching um, and we, oh, you know, we always, when we're doing our assessment, offer them some feedback. So that might be something that in self-reflection you use to look at the skills that you have used within that session. Mm. And it could be really helpful to record yourself and to play it back and actually observe yourself coaching against that criteria of what's good practice within a coaching room. So I think that's another way of reflecting. Yeah. I mean, it's time consuming to do that. So if you've had an hour long coaching session, obviously you need to ask permission to record it. But if you have recorded it, it's going to take you another hour to watch it back and then stopping and reflecting. And so it might take you a couple of hours to do that. Um, but I think a couple of hours well spent. I think, yeah, maybe not every time, but no. once in a while. Um, I think another way of encouraging the reflection is to actually get feedback from someone else so whether that's from your supervisor or from doing some peer coaching some co-coaching where someone is giving you some feedback sometimes that can feel a little bit uh, you can start to feel a bit defensive about that where people offer you feedback but it's all obviously you're inviting it you're doing it with the best of intentions so i think that's a good chance for you to reflect and go oh actually yeah you're right i did do that mm. I remember during COVID, we we I set up some co-coaching work. So I was co-coaching every week, just to do that, offer coaches, being supportive, offering coaches that space to come and yeah. get together and do some co-coaching. And the first session I did, I got some feedback from a lovely guy called Tom. People called Tom tend to be lovely. I I've found. noticed this. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and he said, oh, yeah, um, I think there was this one question. I think that was quite leading. And I started to rationalise and justify myself and say, oh, yeah, 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 it was, uh, but only because. And then I just stopped myself. I said, no, actually, Tom, you're absolutely right. That was a leading question. Hold my hands up. Yes. So so that, I think getting other people to watch can be helpful too. Mm. So I think it's fantastic that uh, Jonathan is thinking about reflection. And, yeah, I'd encourage him to do that. And whatever that I'm sure there are many other templates out there, and other models of reflection, yeah, that people might use. Lovely. Best of luck with that. Thank you for your question. We have one more. Uh, Doctor Oliver has asked, "What do you do when a client wants to end coaching early?" 
let them end it early, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. We, we don't want to keep them there beyond no. <laughs> where they want to be, no. do we? Well, then, you said that. So let's, let's think of times where we might not want them to end it early. So let's say they have been asked to have some coaching by their organisation and the organisation has paid for six sessions and they come and after one session they say, oh, I, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, if you've been paid for six sessions, that's quite, quite tricky, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, was, what I've done, tended to do in the past is to go back to the organisation and say you know, that that's come to an end, um, but I'm happy to hold those five sessions open for someone else. Yeah. So I've allowed it to come to an end. And obviously, yeah, if, some, if someone just, if you just don't get on, if you're, if the coaching isn't working because there's a mismatch of personalities or they just find you offensive, <laughs> and <laughs> then again, you, you're going to allow the coaching to come to an end. Yeah. I was thinking about, not that I would stop the coaching coming to an end, but there may be times where perhaps someone has paid for six sessions. They paid you for six sessions. And they paid individually and they've had a couple of sessions and said, look, I'm, I, think, I think I'm all right now. Now, you might choose to hold on to the money and say, OK, let's leave the coaching open and you can come back whenever you want. Mm -hmm. you know, if it's in six months time, I'll honour that. We've, we had an agreement. You've paid for six sessions. Yeah. Uh, but let's keep it open and you can just use them up when, you, when it, as and when you're ready. And I've had that before where someone has perhaps had six months in between sessions where they've said, yeah, yeah no, I'm, I'm going to be busy or you know, I'm okay for the moment. Can I use them further down the line? Because there, there has been the agreement to pay. Yeah. And quite often people will offer a discount. You know, you can have six sessions for the price of five. So that's the deal, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And if they want to walk away after five, they're not going to get any money back. <laughs> mm -hmm. But you might hold that six session open for them. Yeah. So I, I think as a rule of thumb, let them. Yes. <laughs> is the answer. I've certainly had that where someone has signed up for a series of sessions, a program with me. And after the first one, some stuff came up for them and it mm. wasn't appropriate to carry on with coaching. Yeah. And mm. although they were paying monthly, mm. so they hadn't paid up front. Um, they were paying monthly and we just made sure they were going to the right place to get the right help for what they needed at that point. And I let them go and let them know that they could always come back. Mm. Yeah. So I think we're quite relaxed about it. I don't mm. think coaching depends on who you are as a coach, I guess. But we're not going to persist with coaching if it's no longer required. And again, I think sometimes people will say to me, well, how many sessions will I need? I say, well, I have no idea. Mm. It might all be over in the first session. But let's line up four and see how we go. Yeah. You might need more, but let's start with four and see how we go. And if after two it's all solved and, and they're happy, then I'd draw a line at two. And I suppose there is the chance that someone could come up against some thinking that challenges them. The questions that we ask might be challenging and they might not be ready to explore that thinking. Mm. And so you might think, well, they need to because it's mm. come up and, you know, it's getting in their way. But that's not your choice as a coach to no. make. And like I started with, you don't want to force someone to be there. You can't do that. And you, we always say you can't do coaching to someone. No. They have to want to be there. So if the time isn't right for them to start thinking about their thinking around that topic, now rest assured the thinking has already started yeah. and let them go with that yeah i'm coaching someone at the moment i coached before covid and because he was in a, a medical role and had part of his role was kind of emergency stuff um he said lord i'm just gonna be busy <laughs> yeah just a little bit <laughs> just a little bit so uh he just paused the coach. I didn't expect really to see him again after that. Mm. I, I, I didn't chase him to say, oh, look, COVID's over. Can you can we restart the coaching? Um, I just assumed life had moved on for him. But then he came back and said, can we restart the coaching? Because I've now got a new position and I really want to give some thought to that. Mm. So can we re-engage? Which is lovely. But yeah, I think it's, um, I think it's definitely, the answer is, let it end. Yes. Be comfortable with the ending. Yeah. 
Well, hopefully that is useful. If you have any more questions for us, do send them in to us and we will feature you on a future episode Q&A. Lovely. Thank you, Alan. Enjoyed that. Next time on the podcast, we will be... I think we'll be exploring another challenge in coaching. I'm not sure what that challenge is yet, but we will be. We'll think of something. We will. We always do. Thank you, Alan. Bye-bye. Bye for now. This has been a Monkey Pants Productions podcast.